Yo, Tim, Kenny, what's up, guys? How you been? We are live. <laughs> you know, this whole time in a pandemic, Tim Tim lives like 45 minutes, and I would say like at least once a month we'd go hang out somewhere, whether it's your meetup, my meetup, but uh, it's been kind of difficult. So uh, the cool thing about that, though, is that we do have Kenny joining us from Texas, which is really neat. And That's right. For, for those who are just joining us, we were talking about beer. We're all big connoisseurs of beer. Um, so what's your favorite beer for all those people out there? I want you to type it into the chat room from whatever platform you're coming from. Cause we're coming from three platforms. We're coming from LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube type in the chat, what your favorite beer is. And if you don't like beer, you can say, I don't like beer. You can say you like something else, right? Whether it be iced tea, ginger beer, it doesn't matter. Right. Whiskey. So whiskey's fine. Which, whiskey, whiskey. What's your favorite beverage? If you're not alcoholic, that's good to go. Tim, Tim's moving stuff around. We've got his cats by him. Wait, so, so Tim, Tim, you're in Jersey, right? Like, there's there's a lot of birds. That's what that smell is, yes. <laughs> Tons of breweries in New Jersey. So there's there's one where Tim's uh, – right near Tim's house, we just, what, Heightstown area? Yeah, Heightstown. So it's uh, Old Heights Brewery. It's like three blocks from me. Yeah, and we're we're plugging. Uh, my buddy owns a brewery and uh, called Magnify up in Fairfield. It's not that far from New York, so I guess it's uh, pretty good for uh, for Magnify. So Kenny, what what's your what's your go to beer, man? You got to let me know what's your favorite beer. Independence, native Texan, right here, man. There you go, Tim. How about you? What's what's your favorite? Oh, uh, because it's impossible for me to get. That's why I like it. Uh, there's a small monastery in Prague and they also have the best the best uh, uh, beef uh, what the heck the raw beef that with an egg on it served by a monk in a monastery with a beer that costs one dollar I, I am so missing doing events there and the best meetup crowd ever I had a hundred and twenty people come to a meetup we advertised the week before and they were on every word watched everything asked intelligent questions sat in their chairs excited to be there of course it was a lot of free beer it was i, I was the best meetup ever other than a couple you had in philly because you had a really sweet setup there yeah we did I would say, um, for me, my go-to is Smell You Later by Magnify. It's it's an awesome beer, and it uh, it goes great with a white pizza. So I'm craving a white pizza. Oh, right white now. pizza! <laughs> oh man, yeah. that's oh, I like yeah. white pizza, man. Oh yeah, wow. No, you don't like garlic? I love garlic, man. <laughs> so wait, I like is garlic, but uh, John is that, that the IPA? What's that? That's is that yeah, the yeah, yeah. Against Italy, yeah. man. Wow. It's a double IPA, and you, and you get it goes really good with like you know say some garlic garlic stuff. So I, I'm a I'm a big fan of the white pizza. But enough about beer. What we're really here for is to talk about continuous sequel, right? And my name is John Kuchmek. For those that don't know me, I actually run the Future of Data in Philadelphia. Um, so when Tim reached out to me today. Uh, definitely, uh, I want to take the opportunity to host, which is cool. Um, you know, Tim's runs the future data in New York right now. He also runs the future data in Princeton. Uh, but we have two awesome people with us, Tim and Kenny, and I'll let you let them introduce themselves. But like I said, we're, we're streaming live on three different channels, right? So through LinkedIn, through YouTube and through Twitter. Uh, we also have some really cool prizes for you. You know, and what I want you to do is you have the opportunity to win either first place or second place, but there's a couple stipulations. You have to be here at the end of the meetup. The drawing will be at the end and you have to ask a question. So we're going to run through kind of an agenda when it happens. Right. And what we'll get to is we'll say, hey, you know, it's time to uh, to, to ask some questions. You, that entire time, no matter what channel you're going through, we're going to compile all those questions and we're going to get to them at different points in time. But if you ask a question and we're monitoring across all three channels, so if you leave, your name gets removed from the hat. But if you stay, 
you have the capability to win this cool stuff. And uh, I don't even have some of the swag, so I'll be a little bit jealous of you, uh, 100%. But let's bring back, uh, you know, since since people know who I am, John Kuchmek, let's bring back Tim and Kenny. And uh, let's start with Tim. Tim, why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Tim. <laughs> I, I, do some, I do some stuff with NiFi and other stuff. Don't be too humble, buddy. Uh, principal data flow engineer here at Cloud Era, covering NiFi, Flink, and Kafka. Been running the Princeton meetup for something like fifty-six years, I think, and we've uh, we've had a pretty good run. Huh. <laughs> That's awesome, Kenny. How about you? Why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, sure. So uh, my name is Kenny Gorman. Um, I'm relatively new to Cloudera. Uh, we came by way of acquisition in October, I guess. So it feels like maybe it's been a year already, but it hasn't. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, my background is in data processing, data engineering. I've uh, been doing that quite some time. Founded a couple of companies around streaming data, uh, most recently Aventador. Uh, and you know, our passion was around uh, Apache Kafka and Flink and most recently around continuous SQL and building a product for that. And that's what I'm gonna show you today. So uh, new to Cloudera, my, my role here is um, a product owner for stream processing. So I'm on the product side um, and we just rolled out this um, killer app from uh, Aventador into the Cloudera manager stack. And I'm gonna show that pretty excited. So I'm super excited, you know, I gave a quick introduction to myself, but I've been using NiFi for a long time. And I, I um, it actually is what wanted me to join Cloudera, right? To work closer to that product. And I've been playing with SQL Stream Builder a little bit, continuous SQL. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I have that level of, of excitement again. And, and that's something that, you know, it's hard to chase with tech and it's really cool. Uh, it's just another thing that now I get to, to hang my hat on and say, man, this is awesome. This is. This is something that I get to play with that other people don't, right? And it's, uh, you know, another reason really to, to, to be part of this company. So I'm super excited about this. Um, today, we're going to have pretty much, uh, you know, Tim's going to do a lot of the presentation. Everyone's used to Tim doing the demo. Kenny, this time, is going to do the demo, which is going to be really neat and uh, and show you some of the stuff, right? right. Show you some of the guts with SQL Stream Builder. So. Yeah, of course, it's a live demo, so things can go wrong and things will go wrong, but who cares, right? This is all about having fun and, and showing people exactly, uh, you know, what's going on. So we're going to cut over to Tim. Tim, you want to uh, you want to start? Yes, I brought in a media consultant with me. She's going to she would she helped me design some of these slides because uh, they were a little boring. So she's. Uh, she probably won't stay too long. She just wanted to say that she did this top uh, bar for the slides, and she did a couple other things. You'll see that they're a little uh, hipper, a little uh, hipper. Animation. Yeah, there's, there's some animation in there that hopefully people will like. We <laughs> we did our introductions already. Uh, I'm gonna go a quick uh, overview of Flink. Show you a little taste of uh, SQL Stream Builder. Uh, we'll do some question and answers if we have them before we get into uh, Kenny's demo. And then we'll do a interactive Q&A panel session, tell you the meetups that are coming, but definitely stay for the raffle. You saw those great prizes. You just have to be here and be here at the end and, you know, however long that may be, hour, hour and a half. We'll have to see how long it lasts there. But uh, definitely ask a question or even a comment. You know, it doesn't have to be the most complex question in the world, but, uh, you know, it could help uh, you get into that raffle. If no one asks a question, I guess me, uh, Kenny, and John get to split the stuff. So don't ask questions. Don't ask any questions. I'm needing some of that stuff here. Okay, let's get in here. As you see here, we got a nice uh, pop there. So... Uh, Cloudera data flow, we've got a lot of different use cases. Now that we have SQL Stream Builder in the stack over there on the right, um, it really enhances some of the things we could do here, especially around uh, use cases where you have to bring together different sources of data, do things like real-time alerts. You know, we've been used to with NiFi and Minify, getting that data, moving it around, you know, updating logs, 
you know, getting those things started, getting them into Kafka. But until we got the, you know, Flink, it was uh, a lot of work to be able to do that next level of application where you join together those different streams. You're doing those advanced use cases that people really wanted. I mean, yeah, you want to get data. You want to bring in those logs. But to be able to make real-time decisions, be able to do predictive maintenance, be able to do fraud analytics as money is uh, and transactions are happening, very important. Flink gives you the infrastructure to do it. But, you know, do you want to write Java code? Uh, I've been doing that for 20 years. I'd rather write SQL. I've been doing SQL. It's easy. It makes sense. It's easy to describe what you want. SQL Stream Builder lets me build these distributed applications with simple SQL, which is pretty awesome. So it's my three favorite uh, teams working together here. NiFi, get the things into the hopper. Kafka, making it available to whoever needs it. Flink powering those streaming apps. End to end, the full data pipeline. Go the right way. Uh, Kenny already mentioned where he came from, and I can't tell you how happy we are. This was perhaps the the best uh, bringing together of uh, technologies that you could have asked for. So we are very, very happy to get Kenny, his team, and the tech. It's really awesome stuff. I didn't think I'd like his uh, software as much as I do NiFi until I got something that I could do it with SQL. And then we've got REST in there. And there's new features coming, which I don't know what build Kenny's going to show you, but it's pretty awesome. And what's nice is it is built on really solid technology. If you look at the numbers for Flink here, I don't want to just read them to you, but we're talking serious amounts of data, really large clusters, all, all the things that you need from a distributed application, all the high availability, the ability to deploy on different distributed platforms like Yarn and uh, Kubernetes, having that rich SQL. Uh, you'll see a project in there that you should know from NiFi, you should know from Phoenix. It's everywhere. Apache Calcite means we've got that same rich SQL here as well. So you don't have to worry that it's a limited subset of SQL. It's very rich. And uh, Kenny has some pretty cool SQL examples to show you. Uh, some of the features of Flink that are very important is that ability to be distributed, being able to support really large applications, and something a little different from what we've done in different streaming uh, tools out there to have a lot of managed state. This is something that's a little difficult in Spark and some of the other tools, but you could seriously have a lot of state attached to these applications, which having stateful streaming applications is some really powerful things. Being able to do exactly once with the sources and sinks that support it, you know, that's a lot of applications that people have. I want things in order. I want it only once. I don't want things lost. All those things are table stakes in Flink. And then having uh, all that horsepower underneath the engines, very important. And that just plugs into your standard Cloud Era Manager. So it's very simple. You know, pretty standard to do these streaming analytics. I don't want to spend too much on slides, despite the fact that they, they look pretty nice here. This feature, I think uh, you'll see this in SQL Stream Builder. And it's very important is that you have that state there. You have these checkpoints, so things happen fast. You know, if things need to be rerun, you're not losing what's going on. This is very important for a lot of different purposes. And this is probably the best implementation of this compared to some of their engines there. And it, it just works. I don't think we've seen, even at tremendous scale, any problems with this. Very helpful. Uh, one thing that we've added, which is one of the features that Cloudera has that other people maybe don't is having one set of governance and lineage that spans the whole streaming stack and as well as the other data applications that we have here. Be able to connect all that lineage, whether it's coming from Kafka or NiFi or Flink, and be able to see all that along with those sources and sinks in one you know, graph within Atlas, very helpful. 
But this is why you're here today. I don't think people are here to see uh, different uh, administrative tools. You're here to see the new and shiny tool we have, which has, uh, by default, you're seeing here the nice uh, dark screen, but you could change what kind of uh, background you want there. Making this available to people who aren't distributed uh, programmers, which is a limited set of people who know either really advanced Scala, Java, or Python, understand how they can deploy this in complex environments like Yarn, know how to monitor it, manage distribution of those loads, know when uh, you should break something up. Not easy. Here, I write a SQL, maybe join a couple things together. I can run my queries before you know it's deployed to uh, production, get a feel for what it looks like, look at my tables which can be on top of things like live Kafka topics, again, without having to limit yourself to a subset of SQL or any of those limitations you might get with other ways to do SQL on Kafka. Beyond that, the UI is very easy to work with. You'll see how powerful it is there. Uh, some of the things that have really made this stand out, and I'm sure Kenny will show you things like user-defined functions, I know people like those in Hive to be able to do that very easily through the uh, web UI and be able to edit them, you know, very simply with JavaScript, really helpful. And you can put things like transformations on things as they're coming in from sources, being able to access those uh, internal keys and timestamps from uh, Kafka is helpful. And uh, having things like materialized views has turned out to be extremely powerful. And I think that uh, is something that is gonna drive a lot of future machine learning workloads because those materialized view make a rest point available. So I could use it in a notebook, use it in thing like Cloudera visual apps and put it in other kind of applications or microservices that may not be able to consume from Kafka or you might not wanna have to put that heavy weight you know, uh, distributed component in there because for your app, you might not be working in a distributed, disconnected environment. You may want to just pull data when you need data or do it at a scheduled interval and you're not just having data pushed to you and you want to pull when you want. The REST interface makes that great. Makes it easy. SQL on any different stores you have. Join them together. What's cool here is being able to join them regardless of where those came from. So you could have topics from different Kafka clusters, you know, whatever your environment is, and then push that into that REST view into Kafka. Uh, the webhooks I use a lot to push that into NiFi. So I've got a steady stream of uh, REST there. Uh, in the next release, we'll have some uh, cloud storage options and a couple other connectors there. But, you know, once I have something in Kafka or REST, I could use NiFi or other tools to very easily connect that to whatever applications or data stores I need it to be. Uh, we've got a number of assets. So when you get these slides, you could read more about all the different uh, components we have here. So you can figure out which part of the stack you want to work with. My talk has been pretty simple because the most important part is for you to get to get your hands on this and uh, start using the application. I mean, it's very hard for me not to uh, steal somebody's thunder and jump right in there, but I'm going to hand it off to Kenny so he can do his professional, really slick demo, which I'm kind of impressed with and I need to up my game. You're going to be impressed. The three of us. So we only have a couple questions, and it looks like one comment. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle the comment first, and Tim, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take first crack at the comment, and then if you want, because this really isn't a, a meetup about NiFi, but uh, it's brought up. So it's from XD Profit, which, by the way, uh, you know XKCD sounds awesome. XD Profit, that's a cool name coming from YouTube. So he says NiFi is amazing, but it's easier to write five lines of Python than trying to use NiFi flows. Codeless only gets you so far. Also moving data around just to have an analyst sum up a column. 
terabytes is insane. We gave up on NiFi. So I'm a Python programmer, and I'm going to explain why I didn't give up on NiFi. Uh, you don't, you know, you don't have to like it, but what what an analyst does, you can't help, right? As a data engineer, it's your job to get the data brought in, curated, and ready for whomever needs it. Um, but writing Python code, uh, five lines of code. Yeah, I wouldn't say NiFi equates to five lines of Python code because I've even made custom custom script processes in NiFi that were much more than five lines of Python code. With that being said, I will say this much. Um, you can't stop a, py a Python flow in mid-flow, have the data sit there, make a change to your flow, and then start it back up again. I can do that in NiFi, though. Lineage. Lineage, lineage, everything distributed. Your Python's running on what one? No parallelization. One. You know, I I know they're getting better with like Dask and things like that. Or right? Spark. I mean, yeah. Spark. So yeah, Py. But even PySpark is kind of forced parallelization of Python code, right? Scala Spark is much much better. Um, but uh, that's why I won't equate the two things, right? And and you know, appreciate your comment out there, but I, I completely disagree. As a guy who had to hand stitch code himself. And then was streaming in real time data from PLCs, water treatment facilities, as well as then doing micro batching and batching from any of our enterprise uh, EDWs, right? A any of that. So, you know, just just wanted to highlight, you know, whether it's a good comment or bad comment, we'll still bring it up. Now, XD Profit also asked a, a question about for a continuous SQL, are you using Presto with Kafka Streams? Kenny? No. I'll tell you all about it. So stay tuned. We're not doing any of those things. Although Presto is awesome. We're very familiar with it. Love it. Um, but we have a different approach. So I'll, I'll, I'll dive. I'll show you. So stay tuned. Yeah. So that's definitely going to be brought up soon. Uh, Peter Booth uh, from YouTube also asks, um, how would one be able to understand the current state of a flow at a different time at different time resolutions? So Tim and Kenny, either one of you guys who wants to take a stab at that. So state uh, operations of a flow. Which flow? <laughs> is it NiFi flow? Is it uh, Flink? Yeah. Well, let's let's flow, let's go with flow. let's go with Flink. Let's go with Flink since continuous SQL. So we'll is we'll basic, talk about right? that. A, we'll talk about that a little bit going forward. But, but the, here's the basic mechanic. Basically, how it works is is Flink has save points. It allows you to basically maintain state across the cluster. As you're processing data, maybe you're doing a window operator or something, right? So you have state for the, maybe you're doing a sum across some window. That summary requires state, right? You're doing math within that window. Uh, if that dies and you need to pick up right where it left off, uh, that state picture is what allows you to do that. So it will pick up from the very next record that it hasn't processed. Um, it doesn't have to go back to Kafka, read from offsets and do all that stuff. It just picks up from the state from Flink and keeps processing. Awesome. Good and then there, there's... There's, yeah, great question. And there's there's one question which we'll, you know we can answer quickly. Uh, it's from Cosmo Kramer. Uh, I love the name, by the way, Cosmo Kramer. I'm a huge yeah. Seinfeld fan, so awesome job uh, coming from YouTube. And he's just asking about getting the slides. Tim, are you going to put, put the slides up on the Meetup page when we're done? Yeah, I'll put them up on Meetup. I'll put them in SlideShare. Actually, I'll, I'll export them now, and you'll get to see those cool animations. So... So far, we only have three people that have asked questions, but Kenny's actually going to go into the demo next, right? And so you really need to say, hey, start asking some good questions. I think once you see the demo, you're going to really start saying, oh, how does this yeah. work? How does that work? Hopefully you know, we so. generate some questions, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. going to run through stuff, but maybe, you know, people will say, hey, what'd you do there? And how'd you magically make that happen? So we'll see. And it does look like magic, by the way. So Kenny, it's all you, man. It's time, time to share. All right, cool, cool, thanks. All right, so let me just uh, kind of orient you as to what you're looking at here. Um, so Tim said uh, we we're gonna you know, come out with a new release that shows some new stuff. Uh, I'm showing that new release. So this is brand new. Uh, this isn't quite a nightly build, but it's darn close. So uh, you know, you've know, you been warned. Um, but the reason I wanted to show it is because, uh, you know, just before I get started, just a really high level philosophical point, And that is, you know, stream processing has been evolving over the last, I don't know, decade is probably generous, but the real last maybe five years has been really, you know, going crazy. Um, in that time, I think we've all learned that it's not only streams that matter, right? So streaming data matters a lot. And of course, that's, you know, what we do every day. And what's what I do every day. Um, but being able to enrich and join and then write to uh, 
uh, source batch sources like maybe Kudu or Hive, um, it really brings this thing full circle. And it's it's much more powerful than the sum of the parts. I'm going to show some of that today. Um, so hopefully you guys dig it. Um, all right, so let me jump in. So this is Cloudera Manager. If you aren't familiar, um, this is the Cloudera Manager um, runtime. We're running on one, uh, 716 right now. And you'll see uh, in my cluster here, my cluster is here, I have a bunch of services, right? So I've got Flink. Uh, Flink is the underlying engine for SQL Stream Builder. So, and I'll talk about it when we get a little deeper, but Flink ultimately is the thing that handles all the, uh, all the processing of the data for SQL Stream Builder, okay? Uh, we've got Kafka, we're gonna need that obviously, that's kind of, you know, that's our mechanism for, for event processing or, or event, um, event log. Uh, we've got schema registry. We're not gonna do any sort of Avro stuff tonight, but if we did, uh, we would be right here. And we have SQL Stream Builder. Um, so let me just dive in. I'm gonna show you Streams Messaging Manager first, uh, just so we can kind of look at the data that we're gonna be um, messing with tonight. Um, so I'm just gonna jump into the UI here. And we've got this topic called authorizations. And so I can expand that. I can see that we've got a replication factor of three. Um, we've got a bunch of messages in there and a retention period. Uh, so that's cool. That's kind of high level stuff. Nothing, nothing super fancy. I can go into the data explorer here and I can look at the actual data that I'm gonna be processing uh, in this demo. So what I've got here is it's relatively simple, right? I try to keep it simple so we're not you know, getting confused about all the data and what that looks like. So we got a user ID, we have an amount of the, of the transaction, we have a location and we have a card ID. And, um, and so this is you know, supposed to be you know, like a point of sale authorization. So pretend it's like at a gas station or something like that, okay? So simple data structure, data is coming in through Kafka. Everybody's kind of familiar with how that works, uh, I'm sure. So let's kind of uh, move beyond that. All right, so let's go to SQL Stream Builder and talk through that. So before we get started, um, so I'm just gonna click on that and kind of expose the services that make up SQL Stream Builder. And sometimes the question will come up, someone will say, hey, is this just a nice UI for Flink SQL? Um, the answer is yes, but there's more. Um, and so Tim talked about materialized views. I'm gonna show you what that looks like tonight. Um, we have a materialized view engine that's part of the cluster that processes the Flink retract stream um, and, and keeps materialized views up to date. So that's what that component's for. We have the console. Uh, I'm gonna dive in there in a second, start running queries and show you that. So that's the front end that, that you know, you'll see. And then we have the stream SQL engine. And the reason this is important is it allows you to interact with your stream. So if I'm a Java engineer and I'm writing in my, ID, my IDE, I'm writing some Java code, and I just wanna kind of see my data, you can't really do that without compiling a jar and deploying it and then seeing what happens. Uh, you can, or you can you know, deploy it to the cluster, you can run it local, but it's still, you're just not, it's not, it doesn't feel like a SQL terminal, right? So the, SQL, the streaming SQL engine handles parsing, it handles grammar, it handles uh, communicating with the, the tables, and I'll show that in a sec, and shuffling data back and forth so that you can see the results. So those are the components that make up SQL Stream Builder. All right, so let's just jump into the console. Um, so this is the console that you saw the picture in, in Tim's slide, which kind of changed the background and stuff and made it bigger so that it works well on the, uh, on the demo here. Um, but let's just dive in to a query and we're gonna kind of talk through it here. So, you know, this is a SQL terminal. It looks like probably a million other SQL terminals you've seen. Uh, so there's nothing special there. Um, and we've tried to make it work that way. We try to make this experience as much like just using a database as, you know, as you know, everybody's familiar with. Uh, but there's a couple of really different things about this. Um, and, you know, we use the term continuous SQL all the time. What does that really mean? Continuous SQL means that we're gonna run this query and it's gonna go out and run on a Flink server and it's not gonna complete until we stop the job. So in a, you know, in a regular SQL query, right, we would type in some SQL, we would hit go, it would get parsed, uh, a plan would be created, uh, then it would be run on the server and maybe like used indexes or maybe there was hints or something. And then you know, it would return the data into a cursor and our app would consume the cursor and then we'd be done. And that's like kind of the life cycle of a query on a, on a relational, typical relational database. Here it's different. Here what we're gonna do is we're gonna run this query. It's gonna create a Flink job. It's gonna run the Flink job against the table, whatever table we specify here. 
and it's going to start returning data to some sink. Okay. And I'll talk about the sources and sinks here in a second. And then it's going to sample the data back to us so we can see what's going on. Um, okay. Before I run it, let's just talk about a couple things here. Number one is in continuous SQL, time matters a lot. So in this case, we're using event timestamp as our time key, and we're doing a tumble window using that key uh, every 10 seconds. Okay, so that's just kind of how we want to see the data. Um, there's hop windows, there's session windows, there's all sorts of different windows. And uh, you know, in your mental model, when you think about continuous SQL, think about time as being a first class citizen. There really isn't a use for like select star from my table. That just would run forever and not be interesting. So what we're trying to do here is create windows so we can get output and see the output and, and make, some, make some decisions about our data. All right, everything else here is normal, right? A group by, probably familiar with that. We're grouping by the time and the user ID, and then we're summing the amount, so pretty simple. Um, let's talk about authorizations. How did we get that table? Where did that come from? How, where's the data coming from? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to tables, and I've got a bunch of tables here, and I'll show you um, some of these here more in detail in a second. But let's just go into that and, and explain how this happens. So basically what we're seeing here is we have a table named authorizations. Um, it's our local Kafka cluster. So there's no authorization or anything. I can just select it. I'm already authorized to the cluster. Security's not an issue. I can just pick it and we're off to the races. I can pick any topic I want that's in that cluster. I can pick a data format for it. Uh, I mentioned that we had um, the ability to use Avro. I'm not gonna do that here. This is just JSON data so you guys can see it. Um, and then we can detect a schema. So it actually goes out We click on the detect schema button. It's gonna go out, it's gonna read the data it's gonna infer types from that JSON structure and then build our schema for us dynamically. So this is sweet when you just don't know what kind of data is in there, um, or maybe the, um, you don't know what types they are, like what they would typically, what kind of types they would typically be, right? So that worked great. You can also see the Flink DDL that made up that table. So I'll show you in a second, if you wanted to just type this in and create it this way, you could do that as well. It's a lot, a lot of text there, so most people don't wanna do that. Um, I mentioned event time, and so I just want to point this out real quickly. We have uh, a higher level control over our event time than we did initially, so this is kind of a new feature. Um, and it allows us to implicitly or explicitly uh, define where the timestamps are coming from. And for tonight, I'm just going to use the Kafka timestamp time called event timestamp. So keeping it easy, but you could do all sorts of stuff. You can specify the column, you can give it watermark timing, all sorts of stuff there. You can also specify a transform. Um, this is in JavaScript. I'm not doing that right now. Uh, but if I wanted to do that, I could actually transform the data. Maybe I wanted to do upper on a key or exclude nulls or something like that. I could do that actually on input. And then there's typical properties that you would expect from something like Kafka, like reading from the beginning of the topic. Okay, so that's, that's how we make up the schema. That's how we define a table. Pretty easy. Let me show you one more thing though. So this is a new feature that's coming out. It's not yet out, but um, it will. Everything else I'm talking about, I'll, I'll point out when stuff is not publicly available yet. It's very soon, very imminent, um, but I'm gonna, I'll, I wanna show you a couple of cool things here. Um, the next one is Flink DDL. And so this is brand new stuff. Um, I can create actually using the DDL syntax for Flink, any other kind of table I want. So in this case, it's actually a data generator table. So I can give it some specifications and it will generate data in this schema format. Um, I can use JDBC. So I can get, make this a source or a sync, things like that. So a couple different options there of templates, um, but even things like the HDFS connector, the file system connector works great here too. So anything that's a you know, DDL sync um, or source will work here um, and um, super easy to configure. All right, so that is kind of setup stuff, talking about the background. So let's, let's start running stuff and we'll talk about how the flow works. So first of all, you need a job name. Um, you can pick whatever random name you want. Um, we took a hint from the Docker uh, naming standard there, kind of cute. Um, you can pick a sync. I could pick any one of these topics to be an output topic. Uh, I could pick this file system output, which is actually HDFS or something like that I talked about, or JDBC. In this case, I'm not gonna pick any sync. I'm not gonna put the data anywhere. I'm just gonna return it to myself and um, I, I can execute it. So. What's going on here? So I have a little Docker container in the background that's generating transactions in, into Kafka, right? And so that's what's putting the data into authorizations. Um, and so when I click uh, uh, execute like that, again, we're gonna parse that piece of SQL, we're gonna look at the grammar, we're going to build and start the job, 
We're going to take the jar, put it out to Flink, and then we're going to start returning data. So what I didn't do there is I didn't pull up my IDE. I didn't write even one line of Java. I didn't think about things like watermarks. There was no scaffolding, like Java scaffolding to put up. There was not 100 lines of code. Uh, I didn't create a jar. I didn't copy the jar out. I didn't do any of that kind of stuff. I just hit execute. And so I'm starting to get results. So um, I could have named that a little bit better. I could have said like as foo or something cooler than expression one, but whatever. We'll, we'll just roll with it. Um, my, my bad. Um, all right. So what are we seeing here? So imagine that uh, this is water flowing through a pipe. And imagine we have a sight glass or a piece of clear pipe and we can see the water flowing through. That's what sampling is. Sampling is just simply the way of looking at that result as it's flowing through. It's not the entire result. And if it didn't stop, it would run forever. Okay, so I can always kind of resample. I can always look at the data again, that kind of thing. Um, so that's that's the sample starting up again. Uh, okay, so that's that's kind of the anatomy of a basic query. Let me talk about a couple more advanced things, and then I'll move on to some more advanced pieces of SQL. Uh, and obviously, I'm not doing anything interesting with it. I'm just looking at it and saying, oh, okay, that's you know, these are some, you know, sum of this amount by user ID. Cool. Uh, if I wanted to make it a 20 second window or I wanted to, you know, uh, perform an average or something like that, you know, that's regular SQL stuff. I'll, you know, you guys know how to do all that. All right. So some advanced settings that are kind of cool and important here. Um, so first of all, um, we have a restart strategy. And so if something dies in the process, a computer dies or like, like a cloud node ever goes out or anything or a machine ever goes down. But if it did, uh, then we'd have a restart strategy and when things came back it would start up and it would have a, it just has a retry threshold. So that's kind of cool. Um, we can specify job parallelism. So, you know, if this job was particularly heavyweight in processing power or processing requirement, we would set this to 10, right? Now I showed you earlier that I had three partitions in my Kafka topic. If I set this to 10, I'm going to starve seven of them, right? So I might want to set this to three maximum, something like that. So just a tip on kind of cluster size in there. Um, I can sample one message every second. So this is, I told you about that kind of site glass, if you will, of looking at data. So a couple of controls around that. And then I can restore from save point. So one thing that's really cool is I can stop this job, restart this job, and it picks up exactly where it left off. Left off. So this is the question earlier kind of touched on this. So let me just touch on it a little bit deeper here. So as I'm doing this sum over this window, state must be used, right? This, the, the current sum must be kept somewhere so we know how to pick back up. That's what save point allows us to do. Uh, now, it does not need any more data to pick back up. That data has been processed. We have it on disk. It's saved, in, in fact, in RocksDB. And if the job came back, we'd restore from that save point and continue processing right, right from where it left off. The reason this is super important is that if this said like one week uh, and we had 10 jobs running, something like this, uh, like this is our production environment and stuff went down when it came back up we don't want to have a massive rush uh to go pull data from kafka and pull it into these processors then everything's behind and you know everything's latent so flink state is amazing for that because it allows you to just pick right up the state saved on the clusters locally and it's it's you know off to the races it also by the way is important to realize that flink is scaling in a different dimension than kafka so if you needed you know, more Flink processors to handle the load, you could do that and not have to scale Kafka as well or vice versa. So just a couple couple architectural tips in there as we kind of talk through things. All right, so let's run something more complicated. Um, let's do, let's try for the uh, for the crazy one here. So um, I don't know if they're gonna work or not, um, but since this is a meetup, let's just, in live, let's just do it because let's tempt fate here. Um, all right, so this is a join, and we're going to join. The data we're pulling back is aircraft data. Um, we are going to part, do a window partition, a little bit different syntax here, a little bit different grammar. We're going to sample the current row and the second and the two preceding rows, um, and we are then going to join it with FAA aircraft to get the model of the aircraft. All right, so let me let me just dive in here a little, tell you a little bit more about this so you kind of understand what this matters. If I do, I think this will work. Select star from aircraft. Aircraft to airplanes. Airplanes. 
Okay, so I'm going to run this query, and um, let's do a good job here. Okay, so we're going to run that query, and as we run it, I want to show you the data here as it starts to come back. So this data is actually live data. It's um, being captured via AD, ADSB um, uh, mode B uh, antennas uh, <laughs> via ham radio and uh, converted uh, down to uh, JSON packets that then go into Kafka. So, um, and so look at the data. What's interesting here is like, you can see it's incomplete, it's sparse. In some cases, I'll get a tail, I always get a tail number. Sometimes I get an altitude, sometimes I get a, a speed, sometimes I get a, um, the latitude or longitude, but it's not lining up. And so this is kind of normal streaming stuff, right? Like this is normal kind of messy streaming data. It's just a stream. Whenever, they, whenever the endpoint has a piece of data, it's just going to send it down the pipe and kind of makes a mess on our side. So that's why, stop that job. That's why we want to do something like this. When we partition window here, what we're going to do is take a couple preceding rows. We're going to take the first value and it's going to make a complete record. Then we're also going to left join to get the tail number. So let's get, let's tempt fate here and let's give it a shot. Let's give it a name. Yeah. And uh, this may take a few seconds to start up, but we'll see what happens here. A uh, couple more things about this. We're also parsing out where things are not null. Um, I talked about first value over uh, that window, and uh, oh, a typical join condition they, in. Uh, so joins can be much more complicated, by the way, in, in streaming SQL. In this case, I'm using the most basic possible way of joining, and I'm joining on a single key. Okay, So the grammar supports kind of super rich joining with like static tables and things like that. Here, it's just a join, a stream to stream join, pretty pretty simple. But there you go. So now, now you can see like I've got tail numbers, I've got a, a, a altitude, I've got a latitude, longitude, um, and I've got the tail number equivalent, and then I've got the model. So that's like really cool. That's, a, that's like a super simple use case, but I can do that at scale. We can take all that fire hose of data. We can you know, parse it down to something more usable, join it and enrich it. Um, so pretty common use case. Um, OK, let's pull one more out of history, and then we'll go a little bit further. So now this one is, and so you know, there's a ton of, you know, this is, this is CalSite grammar, so you can you know, build whatever SQL statement you want. I'm showing you kind of some cool ones, some highlights to kind of get your get your mental model wrapped around the kind of the power of this, right? Um, but all the group by and simple joins and and obviously all math math operators and um, you know string operators and kind of all the functions you'd expect from normal SQL grammar all in there. So th these aren't obviously the only things you can do with this. Um, okay, so this is match recognize. Match recognize is cool because it's actually complex event processing. So uh, let's talk about how this works, since it's pretty neat. So what we're doing here is we are saying um, over three different patterns with an interval of one minute, like you always read SQL kind of from the inside out, so that's why I'm starting in the middle. Uh, with, with an interval of one minute, we're going to define three different uh, layers that we're going to pass through. So we're going to take the amount, and it's going to go from 0 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000, then anything above 2,000 within one minute. OK, so maybe this is our fraud algorithm. Like maybe what we say is like, oh, OK, I want to catch people who are going to the gas station and they put their card in and like they try and I don't know, maybe they're at the convenience side of it or whatever. Bear with me here. This is not a perfect example. But um, then they do something for like 500 bucks and then they do. Oh, that works. OK, let me do something for, you know, 1200 bucks. OK, let me do something for 5000 bucks, that kind of thing. So this would catch that kind of authorization pattern. All right. So let's run that. And while we're running it, I want to show you kind of what's happening with Flink, because uh, it's cool. So like I said, this makes a jar. It packages it up into a, a, a jar. It does all the, um, uh, all the dependencies and everything for you. I didn't have to do any of that stuff. Um, and so I can go to my Jobs tab, and I can pull up the Flink dashboard. So Flink is a first-class citizen in Cloud Air Manager and the Cloud Air CDP, CDP stack. Um, you can run a Flink job if you want. You can just you know, upload a jar if you want. Um, but we're not doing that here. We're, we're using SQL because it's so much easier. So these are the operators in that job. In that job, uh, it's kind of broken it down for you. You can see that we've got a source operator here. And this is all like parallelism one. I'm not doing anything 
super scalable. It's just a small cluster. Um, I'm then uh, figuring out the time attribute uh, and then forwarding that to the match algorithm. Okay, so that's pretty cool. That's core Flink stuff. If you wrote that in in Flink itself, it would be uh, 300 lines and it would end up with the same thing. So we made that a lot simpler. You can see data passing through all the different stages. Um, you can see if there's any exceptions. There isn't. Uh, if I was writing that in Java, if it was me, that it would be full of exceptions because I suck at Java. Um, it's like golf, I guess. You're never really good at it. I don't know. There's experts, I guess, but <laughs> it feels like golf to me. Uh, all right. Uh, and so then we can see uh, the checkpoints here. So this is actually the checkpoints that are being created at those different stages of um, of those operators. Okay. So gives you a li little bit of feeling that it was acknowledged, um, the timing it took to do it, the size, things like that. Okay. So this is core Flink. This is the engine behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, frankly, we're not doing a ton of um, magic here. A lot of the magic is all about bundling up, deploying it, and doing it in a way that just makes it easy so you didn't have to deal with, deal with it yourself. Um, okay, so that's the job. Um, let's talk real quickly about materialized views. Uh, and then um, then I think we can jump over to some questions because uh, I know that's a lot and I'm probably talking fast and going fast. Uh, okay, so stop that job. Let's just pull up a fresh I'm going to run that aggregation that I had before. Just something simple here. Um, all right, let's talk about materialized views. So what is a materialized view? Get this question all the time, which if you're a database nerd, right, we had materialized views I don't know, 25 years ago. Um, it works kind of the same way. The idea is we're going to have a stream that's mutating. And that stream uh, is based on the output of this query. Okay, so in this case, it was that user ID, the sum of the amount, and then the timestamp. And what we want to do is we want to say, hey, show me the latest state by that key. In this case, I'm going to pick user ID. Um, let me just pick an API key and apply that. And what I want to do is I want to see the latest state so I can integrate it into an application that can't handle a stream. So for instance, Tableau. This is a great way to integrate with Tableau or Grafana or uh, DataViz, uh, one of the Cloudera products. Uh, or uh, imagine you're using a notebook and you want to do some sort of analysis on this data um, in Python. And uh, so a common pattern there, right, is, is I'd, I'd build a data frame and I would want to then you know, fetch this data and then I'd, I'd perform some analysis using Pandas. Okay. This is going to be one line to integrate with that, right? So let's let's add a query and let's let's talk through that. So in this case, I'll just call this fraud pretend. Um, I can also uh, pass in variables, so I could pass in a column name uh, here. I could say you know amount or whatever it was, and so I could actually create drill down views in REST, um, but I won't do that right now. Keep it simple. Uh, I can select all the columns here. Um, and by the way, when I read this, there's no indexing. Uh, there's no sort of DBA. Um, magic required. It's not a key value store. You can query by any predicate. So it's very flexible. And otherwise, things like Tableau and stuff just wouldn't work. Right? I can add some filters like maybe not null or something like that. I could say user ID, you know, it's not, it's less than or equal to some value or whatever else. Uh, that's particularly nice when I use those filters. And I can save that change. And so now what I have is I have a durable REST URL that I can give to my data scientist and say, here, plug this into your, you know, into your code, fetch and deserialize it from JSON, and um, and you're off to the races. And the you might say, well, that's kind of simple, but think about what's coming in here. I'm I've got the fire hose of data from Kafka, and they've got a notebook. Like they're screwed. They that's the notebooks aren't going to do very well with you know a million events a second or whatever might be coming through. So. This is a great way to pre-aggregate, filter, summate, arrange by time data, and then present it out to these calling applications in, in a way that they can understand. I can't put you know, a million events a day through Tableau. It just doesn't have the capability or machinery to do that. And so materialized views allow us to, to do that. And so when I execute it, now it's gonna create a materialized view and I can go over to, I think I can go over to let's see if I can tab over here to that rest endpoint and oops different window now I'm breaking my demo here we go copy it let's see if we're getting results yet all 
right, so there you go. Uh, it worked, uh, thank God. Uh, so yeah, so now basically that's just REST data, right? Like I know that looks like a wall of text and it is, but if I'm pulling that into Pandas, now that makes a ton of sense. And so what we're seeing is the latest state by key. So every unique key now has its latest state. Okay, so kind of simple in its, in, in its design, um, super powerful in, in practical use. Um, last but not least, I want to talk about a couple things. We have functions. Uh, Tim mentioned this, and actually, I didn't have any functions in here. I wasn't even going to show it to you, but Tim mentioned it. I was like, oh, God. So I went over and copied a function in here real quick so I could show it to you. Uh, this one is, uh, so it, okay, look, this runs um, JavaScript uh, under Nashorn, and so that allows us to compile JavaScript down to Java bytecode, uh, and it allows you to then write uh, use JavaScript as your procedural language. So in this case, I've written a Haversign formula to parse distances, right? So I can take in distances, I can do some math between them and return a distance from, from the place. And then you simply use them in your, in your statement. Let's say I wanted to say distance from Austin. I could use it like this, or like that. Okay, so um, soup, that would be a syntax error. There we go. Um, simple, easy way to use that. I didn't reboot. I didn't rebuild the cluster. I didn't compile new jars. I simply just wrote a new UDF from scratch and, and ran it right away. So super powerful. If you come from Postgres or Oracle, you'll know that procedural languages are important there. And you know we wanted to have something that, that gets us there too. And JavaScript is our procedural language, uh, just like Mongo, for instance, has that. Uh, okay. Last but not least, let's talk a little bit about data providers. This is some of the new stuff in 1.4. Um, I can now add a Flink catalog. And so um, if I wanted to create a catalog from Kudu or Hive, I could simply just give it the creds and information here, uh, or the connect string uh, here, and then I can create, then I can add all the tables, and then it creates them up here in this view. So you can see I have uh, so a couple things up here now. I've got a JDBC one. I've got a file system one. These aren't none of these are Kudu or Hive at the moment, but um, it would it would add all the tables here as well. Uh, if I pick file system for instance, you can see that uh, in this case it's um, HDFS uh, things like that. Uh, you can see that the FAA aircraft was was a uh, Kafka topic. Um, and then we have JDBC. And so this one, you know, a lot of the use cases that we talk about, there's this progression. And what users want to do is they say, hey, I want to pull from a database, you know, put in a Kafka or whatever. Uh, so I'll use, you know, connectors and things. And then I'll pull it out of Kafka and do something with it. And I'll put it back into Kafka. And then I'll use another connector. And it just gets super complicated. It doesn't scale. The on-call people hate you. It, it's, just, it's just bad. It's just too many moving parts. So in this case, we're able to pull right from JDBC, uh, you know, mutate that data in some way, and then write it right back to J JDBC, uh, or pull it from Kafka and write to JDBC. That's obviously like the first use case that everybody does is they say, hey, take my click streams, uh, perform an aggregation daily, weekly, monthly, put it in a database. Like that's kind of like the first move that everybody does um, when they're get first getting started. But then later they say like, okay, I don't want to do that in the database. I want to run it right on the stream and I want to use a materialized view. So that's like kind of the more advanced move. Um, so we can we can do we can do either way, um, and and that's coming out. These the ability to have these other syncs and sources is coming out in what's called CSA or Cloud Era Streaming Analytics 1.4. Uh, that release is imminent. The engineering team uh, has done a massive massive push to get this out, and really great work. So I was excited to kind of show you kind of the newest, latest, and greatest stuff. Um, okay, that's. I think that's that covers it. Um, I would love to take a couple questions. Maybe we can go back to three of us and kind of go through them. No, oh, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> so we we actually do have some questions, right? And uh, uh, we're going to start with um, we're going to start with MC Cat from uh, YouTube. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, yeah. I feel like I'm living back in the '80s and the '90s with the MC Cat <laughs> name. Loving it. Uh, how big can the time window be? So I guess we talked about aggregation of data using Windows. So yeah, this is a good question. Um, I mean, people have terabytes of state. I mean, you can have a lot. It's rocks DB. Um, it lives on disk. You have to have enough disk, obviously, to hold the state. Um, but there's not some like kind of inherent, built-in, weird restriction there. Um, you know, 
frankly, when you're sizing your cluster, you're going to want to think about um, the number of messages you're putting through. You're going to want to think about the size of those messages. You're going to want to think about the complexity of the computation, like you saw me do match recognize versus like a simple aggregation. And then you're going to want to think about, well, how big is that window? So those are like the dials that you're thinking about when you're tuning, right? And this question was about, you know, the state size. The state size can be terabytes. It can be huge. Uh, Alibaba runs massive state. Uh, we have customers that run massive state profiles. It just depends on on what your use case is. Okay. So Cosmo Kramer again. Uh, he's uh, he's asking he he's asking does the SQL query run before the inbound streaming data is even persisted? Uh, yeah. I mean, so the okay, yeah. This is a great question. Um, Right, so let me let me try and break this down into all the pieces and get it right so you guys don't call me a liar. Um, right, so in Kafka, we've got topics. Those topics are persisted on disk. We're gonna pull out of Kafka in, into Flink. And by the way, I didn't talk about it, but we support exactly one uh, semantics for that too, as, as well, that API. Um, into Flink, uh, now we're gonna process that piece of data. And as we compute that, state, that, that uh, window picture, now we're gonna create the state for that and write it to Flink Disk. Uh, so, yeah. All right. We have uh, Nitin uh, Chala from LinkedIn. And uh, so he's asking, so in a nutshell, we're converting an unstructured data to structured data on the fly while data is being ingested by Kafka from a source. So right. he's asking that. Right. And so th I'm, I was giggling a little bit because this is, this is frankly the thing we deal with the most, but just to kind of uh, call it out. So uh, schema management matters. Schema management is a pain in the butt. Um, getting it right matters. You saw me do a detect schema. That's you know not perfect, but it helps a lot when you're using something like JSON. If it was Avro, right, we would just pick schema registry and we'd just we'd be off to the races. It wouldn't be a big deal. But what we find, and that's why, by the way, I mentioned the input transforms. What we found in the real world is that everybody thinks they have a schema that is solidified in Kafka. They think it's, they think one thing. Reality is always different. It's always a mess. And uh, and so we had actually input transforms came from a customer, where their data was not what they thought it was. And if you perform an input transform, I showed that real briefly. Um, uh, then that happens before the schema in Flink. So it's after Kafka before Flink. And so that allows if there is, you know, <laughs> misspellings or, you know, uh, junk uh, events like where, you know, it's just some other topic that got polluted in there at some point, things like that. You can filter that out so that it helps you with your schema management ult ultimately. So, yeah, in my demo, I took unstructured JSON data. Uh, now, obviously, I'm creating it in a structured manner, but there was nothing forcing that. OK, I could have dumped garbage in there. Um, I didn't need an input transform because I controlled my input, okay, to be fair. Um, then I ran a query on it that required a schema. Um, and, and by the way, the underlying POJO required that too, right? So we had to create that POJO on the fly for Flink. That's the, the SQL engine handles that little bit of trickery and, and stuff there. I, uh, Eric Beebe and Gus were the two of the guys at Aventador were the geniuses behind that stuff. Um, and and then you know then we can continue processing knowing what that schema is. Um, the other bit that he didn't mention, which is also and that he might or someone might, is that on output what's the schema? And what so what we tried to do here and, and what we argued about internally quite a bit was should we force a schema on output? And I think what we tried to say was um, no, make the schema on output match the query like it would in a database. So if we were to use in a database, everybody's familiar with like create table as select ABC from foo. Mm -hmm. The output schema should be ABC. It shouldn't be like you have to create a table and then you know figure it out with, with two steps. So we tried to we tried to be smart about that. Um, but in this world of stream processing, uh, scheme, <laughs> schemas are a pain in the ass. And we're doing our best. We've got some new ideas around products. And we've got some new stuff coming out that really do help that even more. Um, but today, I, I kind of showed the state of the art of what we're doing. I mean, to me, that's awesome. I'm just going to make a comment. So we used to pull data off of PLCs. And when you have, uh, you know, an engineer at the treatment plant would actually pull a card and put a new card in, it's up to them what they name, you know, naming conventions, right, for tags on data sets when we're talking about like, and 
and it would just break everything right so to, to have that capability to kind of to to have that input transform before actually i mean obviously we didn't have this but man this would have been a lifesaver for me well, you know, i helped you there too it did it did a little yeah uh, here's what here's what how it, here's how it worked this is the nightmare that unfolded imagine you know you know i'll just take up you know kind of a small work a little bit like a couple hundred thousand um events an hour okay imagine four of those are bogus like four of those have some bogus pattern um imagine you know everybody's why is this crashing you know the the just the frustration um and so you know input transforms um not only allow us i mean like think of it this way you can build easily build a dead letter q kind of thing around around that yeah. um, and so i'm don't want to tip our hand too much but um this is kind of the things where frustrations occur and time to market with streaming products get derailed and things like that so that's that was our thinking there that's a very good question very intuitive yeah that's pretty awesome um so we have a question it's from future data i don't are we are we questioning ourselves i'm <laughs> coming from youtube this is awesome it says uh kenny said that one could scale kafka in a different way than scaling flink could he yeah. talk a bit more about the architectural perspective are yeah. we talking about vertical or horizontal scaling right right okay good question yeah and i didn't i didn't kind of go super deep there but um Look, so yeah, there's a few options out in the marketplace for doing this kind of thing today, okay? So we're obviously aware that this isn't the only architecture that has this kind of thing. But the other architecture, the other predominant one is Kafka-centric. I'll just leave it at that. It uses Kafka as its core scaling engine, as its core logic engine, recovery engine, all that stuff. That's cool. I get it. But at the same time, the downside of that approach is if I scale Kafka, I'm also scaling my stream processing infrastructure at the same time and vice versa. So if I wanted to have a job that was called like my production has to be super fast job. And I had one called like, don't care that much about it. Latency wise job. I want the granularity without spending a ton of money to split those things up. Uh, if I'm joining a Kafka cluster, that's my busy Kafka cluster to my not busy Kafka cluster. And I want, which by the way, I think those other people can't even do. If I wanna do that, then um, I would have to scale one of those independently of Flink. And in this case, I don't wanna do that. I wanna say, just scale Flink for the job, the processing power that it needs for itself. And that ultimately saves on cash and resources, frustration, um, on-call schedules, things like that. So that's how they scale independently. They are interconnected. I did. I think I did mention that if I have three partitions and I have 50, you know, flink parallelism, it, it's not gonna help you. So there are, you know, some, some physics of the situation that have to be accounted for. Um, but as soon you have the right partition load and you have the right broker configuration and, and, you know, relatively fast machines, then now you have the separation of concerns between flink and Kafka. And that's very powerful. I think, especially at scale, like when you get to the larger size folks who are trying to join, batch with streaming that gets even more complicated when there's batch involved uh batch with streaming and and the overall latency requirements aren't the same for all the jobs that kind of thing that's an awesome answer by the way and i completely agree um so <laughs> meticulo, <laughs> meticulo, <laughs> meticulo from youtube is asking what is streaming sql is it flink sql yeah yeah good question right like i and sometimes i wonder if i skip over that uh, yes, it is Flink SQL. Uh, you could take any of those statements that I ran today. Um, you could put them into a Java code uh, as a string, and you could compile that into a jar and then run it on a Flink um, cluster, and it would run. Like that's there's no magic there. Like that would work. The difference is you saw me run it in a way where I could hack on it. I could interactively play with it. I could decide I want a bigger window. I could decide I wanted different values or different functions. I could build those user-defined functions incrementally, um, that kind of thing. And that's the real difference. That's the real unlock that SQL Stream Builder provides you. Those three backend services are the thing that differentiates it from just running it as Flink alone. But you're right, from a technical perspective, it's just Flink SQL. The jar is just running Flink SQL. I just, I mean, my first time ever doing Flink, uh, Flink SQL, I messed up all of my, my, 
my palm XML dependencies. Uh, <laughs> once I finally got those right, then you know right. I messed up. I messed up some of the API calls in the, <laughs> in the jar. I messed up. I mean, like I just kept messing up, and I'm like, man. And then you know you have this, and you're just like SQL deploy. And then you look in the back end and the jar is running and you're like, man, this is so much better. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll also mention that it's 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 not perfect between releases, but the SQL I ran on Flink 1.2 is the same SQL I'm running on or 1.12 is the same I'm running on 1.13. That's not true for your Java code, always. Mm -hmm. So Flink is obviously, it's, you know, in its life cycle where it is right now, the, the, the APIs are changing quite a bit. So it's not just Java, it's that the, the entire software development life cycle is, feels different. And that's kind of the, the thing. So we have a, a question from uh, Atul Ashar. Uh, how can we, and coming from YouTube, sorry, how can we join static reference data in Stream SQL for enrichment? Yeah. So I guess stream data and like maybe a slowly changing table or a static table join. Uh, you cannot buy uh, Cloudera streaming analytics uh, right now that does that, but what I just demoed does that. And um, so you could join with Kudu or Hive or JDBC source, just like I showed in the in the demo. Um, that is imminent. So stay tuned for a few days or so. We, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't spoilers, spoilers. I don't want to say, but it's, I mean, it, it, the, the demo didn't crash, so maybe that was like a good QA test right there. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, uh, that's eminent and that's coming out. Um, and, and like I said, I think, you know, I don't know if they joined late or not, but I, I you know, I started off with a little bit of a, a point about that it's not only streams these days. And I want to, I want to kind of double down on that. Uh, you know, stream and batch together are way better than just streams. Um, the world cannot convert. I, I like the idea conceptually of everything is a stream. I, I love that idea, um, being a streaming nerd. It's just not the reality. It's like saying, I love the idea of a schema that never mutates. Oh, I love that idea too. It's just not real. Um, and so being able to enrich with, with static sources, being able to write from a stream into a static table or a batch table or database table, and then use that again in the same stream. Oh man, uh, there's so many cool possibilities. So um, you know, super important to have that capability. That's something that we worked really hard to release uh, very quickly. Um, and so that's coming to the market, like I said, very soon. And uh, we're excited about that. It's not, and we're going to have some more documents on this concept of not only streams and that batch still matters. And that obviously being Cloudera, how can we ignore that, right? We have a huge amount invested in uh, data warehousing and, and and the Hive ecosystem and the, and the Hadoop ecosystem and you know things like Kudu and, and it just goes on and on and those data sources are part of the puzzle and we want to make sure that we treat them as first class citizens. So, you know that has kind of been the philosophy of this release. And, um, it's a good question. So he also has a, a another question that says, uh, are there any restrictions for joining two stream tables with different time windows? So two different time windows for a, a window join. Uh, are they both streams? I wonder um, if so. Uh, yeah, two stream tables. Yep. Yeah. So um, joining streaming tables together is a tricky business, um, and so there is a number. There's there's a grammatical, a correct grammatical way to do that. Um, I didn't show it in my demo. I showed the, the most simplistic join, which was just you know key to key, without doing time windowing. But the kind of the next um, more complicated version of that is is showing a time window from one of those streams. Um, but you can't obviously join two streams where the time doesn't overlap. That would be a non-op. So yeah, there's some logical restrictions, obviously. Uh, that's maybe a streaming Cartesian product. I was just thinking, <laughs> hey, that's, that's all fucked up, so yeah. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, Meticulo again from YouTube says, uh, do you get the fields from Avro fields too, or is it this from database columns. I guess maybe detecting schema, possibly? Yeah, so in, yeah, right, okay, good question. Um, so in the case of something like uh, Kudu or Hive, we detect the schema, we know the schema, we can connect to it and describe it and it tells us what the schema is in the database, okay? So that's kind of the batch case. Um, in the case of Avro, we would go to schema registry and inspect schema registry for the latest version of that schema and it would return that and it would use that in its definition. So. Um, that's how that works, uh, relatively simple. 
in the case of JSON, we gave it, we essentially asked, we, we said, hey, go inspect the data and tell us what the scheme is. I could alter that by hand if I wanted to, removing things or whatever. Um, but in this case, I just ran with it. Those are the three different ways of kind of interacting with, um, with tables. Okay. Hopefully that covered uh, the Yeah, I, th I think so. And if not, you know, Meticulo, you can ask, you can ask a follow-up question. Uh, so we have, yeah. uh, it looks like possibly the last question from uh, Jay Young Chung uh, from YouTube. And they're saying, accessing the output of continuous SQL data via API looks cool. Can you use other serialization formats such as Protobuf, Thrift, Avro, et cetera, rather than JSON? Yeah, good question. Um, Avro is supported, um, so you can do Avro. Um, the, the other thing I want to point out, other than that, though, no, right, not right now. Um, uh, it's Avro and, and JSON are two serialization mechanisms. Um, but there is one more thing. Um, so when I showed um, the REST endpoint, uh, that was JSON. That's always J that's that's only JSON in that case. Uh, but we also support the Postgres wire protocol. So if you wanted to connect, uh, and I don't think I mentioned this in the demo explicitly, if you wanted to connect from something like Tableau, you you know that's how you do it. It's a very widely adopted protocol. But obviously, that's the Postgres wire protocol, not the specific ones that he mentioned in his question. So right. other than Avro and JSON and uh, uh, Protobuf or Th Thrift, no, not right now. Okay, that's a great question. So we yeah, it was a great question. We have two comments that are kind of in the same same line, and uh, it's uh, Atul Ashar from YouTube and Brett M from YouTube that are saying that this is great stuff and this is really well done, uh, and the Q and A and and thank you. So just wanted to highlight that that, uh, that people are really enjoying your talk there, Kenny. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. I you know I do the talk, but the um, the engineering teams. QA teams, all the teams that go in to put their work into this stuff and, and, and make it their passion um, are the folks that really deserve all the credit here. So uh, hat tip to those folks um, who just crank out this cool stuff all day long. I love it. So, Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of, you know, I, I want to say our team in the back end. So we have George, we have Bill, we have Shelby, you know, part of the marketing that put this all together, right? right? You know, they, they there's a lot of hard work that they do in the back end to, to make this happen. And it's it's not all just show up, uh, crack a beer, and and demo some some cool tech, right? Like there, there's a lot of stuff going on in the back end, right. so definitely appreciate them. So it looks like that's it for the questions. Um, I think what we're going to do now is we're going to go over the list of resources. So, you know, what we have is you know there's a cloud area users page, and part of the deck what we'll attach is part of Tim's deck when he puts it up into the the meetup as well as we post it online. Uh, you'll have some of this. There's a, a Cloudera video tour, right? So that way you can actually go and take a look at uh, different pieces of product in a small video tour uh, for Cloudera. And then the future data meetup page. So the New York one's there, but I'm going to I'm gonna promote the Philadelphia one, right? Uh, Philly represent. And uh, Tim has to promote his Princeton one. So don't forget to join those because we have a tendency to either all do the same meetups together, or we then, you know, stagger them when we can finally do them in person again. There's definitely going to be beer involved. It'll be lots of fun. The next meetup, right, is going to be solving the first mile of the data pipeline problem can accelerate analytics. So this is going to be May 12th. Uh, and this is, I, I just want you to highlight, it's 6.30 p.m. Central Data Time, right? So for those that are East Coast, right? So that, that oh, I'm sorry, 5 p.m. Sorry, 5 p.m. to 6.30. I can't read. Reading is fundamental. Um, I do math well, though. Um, <laughs> so 5 to 6.30 CDT, right? So that would be 6 Eastern Standard Time for those that are with us. I know we got people from all over the world, so it's not just then. And Tim, do you want to share your screen and bring up the raffle? We're, we're actually going to have this, uh, this drawing here. Um, so Tim is sharing his screen. Tim, you want to go ahead and click on the winner button for me there, buddy. And the first winner of the prize is... You want to hit refresh, Tim, because there you go. It's Cosmo Kramer. I love it. I love it. Uh, so, Cosmo, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to actually... Uh, wherever you're at, in the chat, give us your email address, um, or you know, we can actually go in and um, you know, 
I'm going to give you social media at cloudera.com if you can email them that, right? So social media at cloudera.com. So if you email them your name and all your information, we'll be able to do that. You want to delete that real quick, Tim, or copy and paste it, and then uh, go ahead. We're going to do the second the second prize winner, and the second prize winner is Meticulo. All right. So you know both people ask very good questions. Meticulo, you're going to do the same thing. Tim, you want to paste that back in social media at cloudera.com. So again, give us your information, right? So uh, what what we'll do is we'll once we get information, we'll we'll mail out all of those products to you for the first place and second place winners. Um, on behalf of the team, uh, I, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Tim. I want to thank Kenny. Um, I love doing meetups with Tim. Uh, I want to thank Tim's daughter because without her, we wouldn't have those cool, awesome uh, graphics going in. You know, with uh, everything rotating itself. So she made it really pop. I would say that was awesome. Very good job, Tim. Uh, I want to thank, of course, the production team as well. And we hope to see you next time. So I, I don't know what our next meetup is in Philly, but it should be sometime soon. Summertime's coming. We're hoping as the world gets on, um, we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to actually do these things in person, maybe do them outdoors. Tim and I talked. Why don't you, George, why don't you bring Tim and Kenny back up one more time here? All right. So instead of us just saying goodbye, just just me, right? Even though I'm the host, I want to bring these guys back. So uh, I, I just want to say thanks, guys. I really do appreciate it. This was awesome. I actually learned some stuff and I played around with the tool a little bit. So, you know, that's a that's a good thing. So a, any any last words from you guys? Nope. Uh, free, we have a free trial if you wanted to try it. So <laughs> sorry, had to put it in there. Uh, no, it's actually I love this format. I thanks for the invite. I, you know, really enjoyed Really enjoyed this. It was it was a good format and a, a good questions and uh, it was fun. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Tim, yeah, I, I, we we owe Kenny a lot because I brought him in on a day off to do a meetup <laughs> and he had everything ready to go and it did an awesome job. Same with John. The John is not allowed to take a day off for the next seven years, but. You know, <laughs> It's all right. Next time, next time we could all be in person. You know, we're, we're gonna buy Kenny some beers, man. We'll, we'll uh, yeah, we'll love it. Some good. We, we all yeah. want to go to Austin, man. <laughs> yeah, come on down. We got we have beer everywhere. It's great. I'll I'll be there in August. So I'm I'm, I'm driving my RV across country in August. So uh, we're we're actually stopping. We have friends right outside of Austin. So we're gonna be we're gonna be right. in that vicinity for a few days. Yeah. We'll see you then. All right. All right, guys. Just want to say goodbye. Thank you very much. See you at the next meetup. <laughs>